Greetings to you from the Christian Institute for Theological Engagement, Christe. Today, we are delighted to commemorate the second anniversary of the Cornelius Cardinal Sim Professorial Chair in Theology and Dialogue. In these past two years, this professorial chair has funded the research of a number of scholars in their social scientific research. Two of our research fellows, one from Malaysia and another from India, have recently presented their findings at a conference in the National University of Singapore, and we are incredibly delighted for them and proud of them. Today, to mark the second anniversary of this professorial chair, I'm happy to share a recorded lecture with you presented by Dr. Tan Ming Yo, Christe's Research Fellow in Religion and New Media, who is also Senior Lecturer of Media and Communications Studies in Monash University, Malaysia. This lecture presented by Dr. Tan is also a result of the collaborative work between Dr. Tan and Christe. I will leave it to Dr. Tan to explain the aim and scope of this research and also to delineate for us what Christians from both the academic and non-academic circles can learn from his findings. Please do listen to the entire lecture, as I'm certain it will benefit you greatly. Hello there. Welcome to my online session on the topic of the future of online church in Malaysia, reflections of church during the COVID-19 lockdown in Malaysia. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, I am Ming Yu. I'm a lecturer in media and communication at the School of Arts and Social Sciences at Monash University, Malaysia. Uh, I am also a research fellow for the Christian Institute of Theological Engagement, um, Chris Day for short. And today I'll be sharing a little bit about the subject of digital uh, religion, online Christianity, and also my research findings uh, on, on, research, on this research topic that uh, I conducted last year. Uh, the picture you see on the screen, uh, those are my two kids. Um, this was uh, during the first two or three weeks uh, of the first COVID-19 lockdown in Malaysia. Uh, the Sunday school was held online and we weren't very well set up, so they were watching a little video that uh, the Sunday school teachers were showing uh, from my laptop. Um, this is just to show that uh, this subject is personal to me as well. I, I, I experienced it myself and I think a lot of us have uh, a lot of memories, both good and bad, uh, on, on a subject that I think, whether we like it or not, we, we were a part of. Okay, um, So just as a background, uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic reached Malaysian shores, uh, churches in Malaysia spent about two years transitioning and adapting to holding church activities uh, exclusively online due to the various movement control orders, the MCO, implemented by the Malaysian government. So the church experience during this time contains several lines of inquiry that can be explored not only from a historical perspective, but from theological and future perspectives as well. So this presentation is, uh, you know, covers a range of issues um, from the uh, institutional perspective. I will share a little bit more on this later. Uh, so we're looking at uh, the implication of converting to an online only church in areas such as logistics, administration, digital literacy, technology, community, theology, a little bit. And, uh, and what, what did we pick up during uh, these lockdowns about online church that potentially can be carried over into uh, a post-lockdown society, into the future. So although the word future is in the title, uh, what we're doing really is reflecting uh, quite deeply on the past in order to guide us on what to think about and how to think about the future. So just very quickly, just a, an outline of the things I'll be talking about today. Uh, the, the first part of this presentation, I'll be giving a background on what this project is about. Uh, I'll also give a little bit of information on the, the research area of online religion. Uh, which I'm not sure how familiar um, you are. So I'll just give a little bit of background. Uh, what, what's the work that's been done in this field of study? What are the things that people are thinking about and discussing? Uh, then then uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll go into uh, some uh, a report on, on what I did and, and uh, what I've learned. So I'll go through the research process. How did I go about doing this project? 
then the bulk of it will be on key findings in um, mainly talking about uh, four things, technology, community, spirituality, and the future. And I'll end with a, just a very short uh, conclusion on reflections and recommendations. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge uh, two institutions. One is uh, my workplace, uh, Monash University, Malaysia, uh, which has uh, kindly given me uh, the time and space to do uh, research and provided the logistical aspects of this project. Uh, and the Christian Institute for Theological Engagement um, for funding this research project. So moving on. So background. All right. So the background I'll be covering uh, a few contextual things. So the first one is just to recap on the movement control order in Malaysia, which you can see in this picture, uh, an empty Kuala Lumpur. Then I'll also give some background on uh, just online religion in, in general. Yeah. I hope that these images are not bringing back uh, difficult memories, uh, although I'm sure there were difficult memories for everyone. So just a quick summary on the subject of the MCO. So when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic started uh, in Malaysia, the action really started around March 2020. Uh, the Malaysian government implemented strict quarantine and movement control orders in response to COVID-19. And by strict, uh, it means total. Okay, So people were not allowed to go out unless they were, uh, except for very specific reasons. So the first lockdown started on 18 March 2020, and it went through multiple phases um, with different levels of restriction, uh, depending on the situation of, of the pandemic at the time. Um, so it went through multiple phases until the end of 2021, early 2022, at which, uh, by which time most of the restrictions uh, were uh, greatly reduced or lifted. So the early phase of the lockdown between March to June in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, uh, was the strictest, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, religious gatherings. Uh, so like churches uh, were closed during this period of time. Uh, so I remember that like the first major Christian event that uh, went online was Easter that year because uh, yeah, within a month Easter uh, was online for the first time. All right. So during this period of time of strict lockdowns, uh, there was broad adoption of online platforms as an, as an alternative. Different churches did it in different ways. I won't really be going into a survey of the different types of online platforms, although the topic will in itself come up a little bit um, uh, through uh, the interviews that I conducted and will be sharing. Uh, as, as the movement control order evolved over time, the level of restrictions and standard operating of procedures fluctuated. So initially it began with a total lockdown, then over time uh, as restrictions began to be lifted, uh, a small number of people were allowed to go to church and then after that more people were allowed and then you got 50-50 situation and then it closed down again and on again. So we, we saw a development of uh, online services as well uh, from totally online services to the emergence of hybrid approach to church services depending on various factors. All right. So currently at the point of this presentation, uh, we are in the endemic phase of the, pan of the pandemic now. Uh, so there are no no more ref, no more restrictions. So this presentation is really uh, looking back at, at a at a time that's at a phase that's passed. It's a time for reflection, and hopefully with a bit of hindsight, we can think about the different issues uh, that emerged during that time with a fresh pair of eyes. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, uh, these are the research questions that I worked with. Uh, First one, what are the new modes of adaptability and survivability of churches in a post-COVID era? So again, we are thinking about the future in a context of reflecting on the past. Yeah. So two sub-questions on that. What were aspects of online church that worked and not worked? Uh, what are the new approaches to Christian sp spirituality and pastoral care? Uh, of course, related to that are uh, issues of uh, how they engage with the community during uh, that period of time. Uh, and the third one, uh, what are the 
what are the elements of online church that is likely to be incorporated into the post-COVID church? Technical, practical, spiritual. Yeah. So moving on, so just know that I'm guided by these inquiries as we progress. Um, I feel it's important that I give you a little bit of uh, background on the subject of online or digital religion. Um, different people use different terminology for this, but they, we, let's assume they mean the same thing uh, as a field of study. All right. So what is digital and online religion and where does it take place? Um, I've just as a context, uh, I've been studying this subject for almost 10 years now, um, long before the pandemic, right? Uh, and prior to me, there have been other scholars who've been researchers who've been uh, working on this topic of, simply because um, it, it already existed in different forms uh, from since the internet started, all right? So um, when we're talking about religion online, it's, it's been expressed in many, many different ways over the last uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, all right? But just as a general, uh, you know, historical timeline, uh, right at the beginning, at the beginning of the World Wide Web as we know it, um, we, we're talking a lot about websites, right? A lot of churches uh, started having an online presence, uh, but along with that, we also started being able to email religious content, okay? Well, these are the early forms of online religion. Uh, the 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 social aspect of uh, religion has also gone on websites like message boards, forums. Um, so so even then there was some kind of interactivity uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> religious presence online. Of course, this moved on uh, as as the digital technology progressed. Uh, it entered what I think what I call the second phase of online religion, which is mainly blogs and social media. Uh, so people started blogging about their uh, their faith a lot. Uh, they're blogging about their spiritual experiences, their church experiences. Um, then of course with social media, people began to be able to interact, uh, not just with their own religion, but with people from other religious faiths as well. Uh, you have very individual kinds of uh, expression. Uh, of course, churches also started moving on to the social media space. All right, so we see a lot of interaction, a lot of engagement, a lot of diversity, but also a lot of uh, replication of uh, what, what they do offline. They started bringing it online. So even uh, pastors, priests also go online. It's not just lay people who went on blogs and social media. Uh, religious Christian leaders were going on as well. Then, of course, uh, the third phase uh, is live streaming. So people are not just posting content online. They are... Uh, live streaming. Now, there are a couple of churches that started live streaming before the pandemic, so it's already there. Uh, but of course, with COVID-19, uh, live streaming uh, was put on, you know, uh, turbo and it, it really took off and it became a norm for a lot of churches. Uh, and you didn't require a lot of uh, expensive equipment to do it, right? You could do it with your phone. Um, then just as a transition point, uh, we have, there's been some work done on on people who set up virtual reality churches um, so like for example i i recently got myself the device as well the oculus uh, uh, quest the oculus quest which is a vr device uh, i wanted to experience um, there, there are some churches that establish a presence online either a campus church or an actual church church uh, in virtual reality environments uh, in mixed realities, you have games where, like Roblox, where they've set up churches. Um, so a bunch of examples. So just just to, to help you visualize it, uh, yeah, the, the, you have websites, uh, you have social media sites, you have uh, forums, then of course, uh, Zoom, the, the picture on the right, we are very familiar with it, it's the Zoom church. Um, Religion is now expressed in many, many different forms, uh, in different ways on online platforms. All right. And, and the last one, as I mentioned earlier, virtual reality, games and mixed reality, 
Uh, for those of you who are feeling a little bit shocked or surprised, just to give you an indication, it really is there. In fact, back in 2004, uh, they've already experimented with uh, 3D environments for church. It's called the Church of Fools. Uh, it's shut down already since. It was a bit of an experiment, uh, but it's moved on, right? So for example, uh, on a game called Roblox, as I mentioned earlier, you have avatars gathering there for a church uh, activity. Uh, and on VR, the most well-known uh, with most media coverage is called VR Church. Uh, it's held on all space we are, although uh, I've recently learned that this platform has shut down. So I think the church has moved on to a different platform. Uh, what you're seeing there is um, an Easter service that I attended uh, just to check it out. Uh, but today we're not really talking about this, but I just wanted you to get a sense of, yeah, there are many, many different ways that uh, Christianity is expressed online, websites, social media, Zoom, of course and all these kinds of games and VR platforms, right? So broad, broad, broad area, um, which, which comes to, uh, let, let me bring the focus back to what are the things we study, right? So when we're looking at online religion, um, there are five areas. I mean, if you've never learned this, learned about this before, there are five areas where a lot of discussion takes place. People, uh, uh, researchers are, trying to describe and define and debate uh, the meaning of these words, particularly when it comes to online uh, Christianity. So authenticity um, are things that you experience online real, all right? Can you have, gen and they're all interrelated, all right? So can you have authentic relationships? Can you build authentic communities? Um, sim same with spirituality. Can, can people experience God online? Uh, a very, an area that I think one of the more significant areas of discussion is the subject of authority. Uh, who has authority online? Who has spiritual authority online? Because the power dynamics when you go online is no longer pulpit, pulpit centric. Uh, anyone can claim to be an authority. They post their Bible study interpretations online. Uh, they can reject the teaching of the church or the institution and engage and talk back. So form new communities, yeah. Uh, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, lead to discussions about what exactly is a church or Christian community and can it be defined online? Is it the same as an offline community? And what does all this mean for a person's uh, spiritual identity? So these are the common points of discussion. I, I won't really be talking through each one in my findings later but you will see elements of each subject popping up, right? Uh, it's quite, quite straightforward in a sense. So it's ongoing. People are trying to talk through these things and it's very, very interesting. Uh, just as a, a little plug, so uh, plugging my own book a little bit. So this came out in 2020. Uh, I, I put out a book published by Springer called Malaysian Christians Online. Uh, Faith experience and social engagement on internet. Now I'm I'm not really plugging my book, but I'm just helping to contextualize uh, today's presentation a little bit. That I'm not new to uh, researching online religion in Malaysia, but more importantly, uh, it's not a new field of study as well. Uh, everything that we talk about today is a continuation from a bigger story. Okay, and I think it's a story that will continue as well. So just as a little background, uh, my book is a pre-COVID research, okay? It focused, remember just now I mentioned uh, the different phases of online religion. So mine was in the phase where people were blogging a lot, okay? Social media was relatively new uh, in terms of popularity. People still blogged quite a lot. So what I did was I interviewed uh, both church leaders uh, and 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 lay Christians, uh, primarily a Protestant focus at the time. So I interviewed them, uh, the people who actively blogged about their faith, both lay Christians and church leaders. All right, so there was a minor focus on the emergence of social media. So I wrote a bit about face Facebook Christianity, um, new, new church communities on Facebook. I wrote a little bit about that in one chapter. Uh, some of the things we discussed, I discussed in, I discussed in the book, I describe a variety of new expressions and spiritual expressions. Uh, 
how uh, my, my interviewees, my participants, how they explored their faith online, how they engaged in the broader Malaysian community, like how do they talk about elections uh, in a, as a Christian, uh, they have theological de debates, uh, as theological discussions, mentorship, spiritual guidance that they found online, um, the different ways of engaging uh, their faith. Again, not just lay Christians, uh, church leaders as well, uh, who found uh, use uh, for for their for their faith. During that time, uh, already in in that for, in that time period, there were already concerns uh, about online religion, which you will see repeated in today's uh, presentation. Even back then, particularly with the church leaders I interviewed, all right, uh, the pastors I interviewed, there were concerns about authenticity, like how can you build authentic relationships online? Uh, and there were also concerns about materiality already, like the church, uh, not so much the bricks, of, <laughs> bricks and mortar of the church, but basically being present uh, amongst the community, uh, being present in worship, okay, ideas of materiality uh, was already present at the time. How, can, like topics like baptism and uh, communion, all that came up a little bit already, right? So, like, if you did all these things virtually, uh, is it genuine? Is it authentic? All right, uh, and there were also concerns about uh, establishment of authority, not in the sense that uh, people uh, are afraid of losing power. But there's concern. There are two two concerns. Um, one is a concern that there's so much information online. Uh, it's difficult. It it's perhaps dangerous for people to depend on the internet to grow their faith because of the variety of information. There's just so much to navigate. And the other is uh, whether the online space is a great place to engage with the church on issues uh, and disputes. So so a lot of new expressions. But back then. Some of these concerns already existed, uh, and we're going to see how uh, th this new project I'm doing in COVID um, will revisit some of these themes. So it's a bit of a sequel project for me as well, or a spin-off, depending on uh, how you look at it. Um, there are a lot of other people who've who've done work who's done work in this area. I just want to point to you to uh, Heidi Campbell. She's uh, one of the most well-published researchers on the subject of online religion. I, I'm not going to take through take you through a whole bunch of literature, uh, but during COVID itself, all right, they, she, uh, uh, Professor Heidi Campbell, uh, together with uh, Sophie Austin, they published a series of reports. Uh, this is very America-based. Um, if you're interested, you can look it up. It's a free report. Uh, you may find this useful. Um, they, they, they reported on pastoral experiences during COVID-19. Okay, so my work is uh, quite inspired by her work to, to work, work with uh, church leaders on learning about their views and experience. Um, so I'm just pointing you to one of the reports. Um, it's called Needed But Lacking, Impact of Pastors' Technology uh, Background During the Pandemic. Um, and in this report, it talked about the traits needed to be an effective digital pastor. So just a couple of quotes from, from that report. This study found that the more familiarity pastors had with media technology in general prior to the pandemic, the easier such leaders perceived their transition online and technological decision making. Uh, church leaders reported having success working with technology during the pandemic, but moving online for church services required taking on new set of traits. The traits pastors identified are essential as essential are typically more closely associated with entrepreneurship than pastoral ministry, meaning to say in the words that they used to describe that experience of transitioning online, uh, it didn't contain um, necessary, it didn't necessarily contain words that we normally associate with the Christian faith, but it's about entrepreneurship. Um, for example, uh, a willingness to experiment, uh, technology demands, uh, embracing new and uncomfortable character traits. They sound a bit business-like, uh, leaders reported that they were unprepared and overwhelmed dealing with change and they had to innovate. And uh, um, even back then I found this an interesting point, uh, pastors often had to innovate in solitude. So these were the findings from one of Heidi Campbell's uh, team's reports. I found it really useful and it inspired my work. I encourage you to go look it up. There are four reports in total. 
um, I'm sure we can all pick at least one or two things that is useful for our respective experiences. So with that background, um, I've basically taken you through, okay, a reminder of what MCO was. Okay, it happened. Uh, just a bit of background on online religion. It's something that people have been studying for some time, uh, but came under the spotlight during COVID because the number of practitioners increased many, many, many fold. And then I just pointed to how there are current research going on as well, uh, ongoing research during COVID-19 in the church as well. Um, now, bringing it back to focus, I'm just going to share with you what I did uh, and what I've learned from this whole process. So research process. Um, so what I did uh, was I conducted semi-structured interviews uh, with uh, 15 participants, uh, 15 Malaysian church leaders. I chose to do semi-structured interviews because it allows for in-depth exploration of specific topics. Uh, it, is, it is likely that different churches have different experiences. So instead of a survey, I chose to, yeah, lesser people, but I, I wanted to be able to talk to them in detail to allow their stories to come forward. So I conducted 15 semi-structured interviews uh, with Malaysian church leaders. Uh, by leaders, I define it uh, relatively broadly. It could be priests, pastors, deacons, lay leaders, council, uh, council members, people who with some measure of authority in the church. Yeah. So it's a, quite an even split between uh, participants from the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. Uh, seven from the Catholic Church, eight from the Protestant Church. Uh, Eleven from West Malaysia, four from East Malaysia. I didn't quite cover, I mean, I, I didn't set out to to look for participants from every state in Malaysia, but it's got a pretty good spread, uh, covered most of the states, not most, but many. Um, and all of these leaders are, are from a variety of ministries. Uh, they could be leading a church, they could be in the kids ministry, some are in the training ministry. Uh, so some with focus on youth work, some with a focus on older folks. So it's a variety of ministries, big churches and small churches, all right? Um, the interviews took place uh, last year, between April to August, so I worked on this for about four months, talking to them. Uh, then together with my uh, research assistants, uh, all the interviews were transcribed, and I thematically quoted them on a qualitative research software called NVivo. Just allow me to categorize the things that I talked about so that I can present it to you in an organized manner. Um, it's an exploratory research. I only spoke to 15 people. Uh, it's not meant to be generalizable, all right? It's meant to be diverse, to give us a sense that, okay, these are the different things that are being talked about. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the total Malaysian experience of online religion, but it is my hope that um, through these different sharings, uh, may we all be able to find one or two things that are useful uh, and we can learn something from it. Uh, just as a note, uh, in terms of ethics and privacy, uh, you won't know who these people are. All, right? um, all the participants are, are anonymized in this presentation. I'm just using an alphabet to describe them. Um, this is to protect their privacy. Uh, because in the, in the conversation, sometimes they share freely about their experiences, which can be a little bit sensitive. Uh, and so their identities are protected uh, in this presentation. So I'll be presenting my findings first with this, these three areas. I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll be talking through the, idea, the topic of technology and the COVID experience. Then I'll talk about community, how uh, the, the, the leader's view on co uh, church community engagement, which includes the pastoral aspect of their work during COVID-19. And the last bit, which is I, I wanted to find out what they thought about uh, the spiritual aspects of online church. And so uh, I'll be sharing a little bit on that as well. Okay, so a lot of it's quite descriptive. I'm just highlighting different themes that come up. Uh, and then at the last section, I'll just share a little bit on thoughts on the future. All right, so three areas. I'm trying to keep it quite neat. Technology, community, and spirituality. And of course, they intersect and overlap one with another. Um, some limitations and opportunities here. 
Uh, my project is not a perfect project. As I mentioned earlier, it's also not meant to be generalized. Uh, it's a small sample size and further research is needed. I am still working on this uh, together with uh, another research team, but I'm looking at uh, lay members. All right, so the second one in this project, we're not looking at experience of church members. I'm working on that now together with Dr. Pauline Leong and Dr. Lim Hock Han uh, on another, another Christie grant. Uh, and it's not comparative in any way. So uh, although it may uh, come across that way, I'm not really comparing actively comparing the Protestant and Catholic experience. I'm also not comparing the Malaysian experience with that of another context like Singapore, or Thailand or Indonesia. So it's meant to be exploratory, small scale. And I understand the limitations have come with that. And I would love to continue doing more research in this area. All right. So on to key findings. So for uh, every part, technology, community, and spirituality, uh, I will give a very brief uh, description of what I was looking out for. Um, then I will present two or three uh, key themes that uh, came up at least a couple of times, uh, dominant themes. Uh, on that particular subject, uh, I won't be able to feature what every church leader said about every single topic, uh, but I'll highlight some representative uh, quotes just to give you an idea of uh, what uh, what came up a couple of times. Um, but every participant that I've interviewed would uh, be featured at least once. Yeah. So for the first one on the subject of technology. Um, the aim was to investigate church leaders' experience with setting up an online church when the first MCO happened. The focus was on transitioning from uh, offline church to the first lockdown, the most, the most sudden and the most drastic shift. So I talked to them about their experiences at the time, the challenges, the difficulties, uh, what they've learned, uh, how they went about it. Uh, so these were the key themes that emerged. Um, so the first uh, thematic focus uh, is on uh, existing expertise and digital literacy when it comes to technology. The, the usefulness of having ex existing uh, knowledge about digital tools. And on this, uh, we can see how it's contributed to the continuity of church. Now, when COVID hit, uh, all, uh, all the people I interviewed, all the church leaders, uh, emphasized on the importance of ensuring the continuity of church, whether it's through uh, interpersonal communication or ensuring that there's an online presence, uh, online service, or at least a chat group, and we'll talk about this more as we go along. Uh, but the continuity of church was a very, very important focus. And one of the advantages uh, of having existing expertise and digital literacy was that they're able to ensure this more effectively. When I say effectively, I don't necessarily mean high tech. All right. So like, for example, that the two uh, quotes that I have here, uh, the first one is by a pastor in Selangor. All right. Uh, he basically talked about how uh, the church had a new lead pastor. All right. Uh, who, uh, who was equipped. All right. So I'll read the quote out to you. We are very blessed to have a succession transition at the beginning of MCO meaning where our previous lead pastor passed the baton to our current lead pastor. We know that somehow we couldn't plan it any better. We felt that God had really, really had it all figured out, where our current lead pastor is actually very tech savvy. So he's a professional photographer and a videographer. So when a pandemic hit, he was well equipped to transition a church in an online capacity. He, he knew how to set up the camera, the lights, uh, edit the videos, um, set up streaming, uh, and engage with the members very quickly. All right. Um, so this one, a bit of a high tech example. Okay. Very equipped. But as I mentioned earlier, it didn't necessarily need to be high tech. It just needed to have some level of literacy. Okay. So another uh, church leader from Johor, Father P, uh, zoomed into just using what he already knew, which was Facebook. So he said, this is my own initiative. Uh, somehow I am a little bit tech savvy. So of course, like uh, Facebook, and when I come to this parish, I initiated with Facebook uh, as a kind of communications to the to them, to the people. 
So I try a very simple way to bring to the local people, uh, to the people of my own township. All right. Okay, so I started with live streaming through Facebook, just using a little gadget and phone, okay? Just put a tripod on and just put on live streaming. Uh, so he knew how to use Facebook, he knew how to use the camera, set it on a tripod, and there was enough for him to connect with the local people, all right? Uh, I highlighted, you see that I highlight some words uh, because some of these things are, I don't necessarily have a slide to talk about these themes, uh, but uh, they're worth noting. Uh, like in the first quote here, you will see that uh, it occurred a couple of times uh, that that even during, uh, upon reflection, that people try to make sense of where God is during the entire uh, COVID situation, all right? So this is one, there's another one called uh, another pastor, a children's church pastor, who talked about how God took them through. It's quite a common theme. All right. And the second one, you see the importance and this importance, is, as I mentioned earlier, highlighted many times that they, they, they were looking at ways to engage with the con community as quickly as possible. Now, moving on, uh, uh, moving on, uh, more examples of ensuring of the usefulness of existing expertise and digital literacy. So it's not just continuity of church, all right, not just church services, for example, but it's also ensuring community engagement. So uh, Sister Y, uh, based in East Malaysia, um, actually said that even though the services didn't immediately went on live streaming for a while, because they struggled with technology at first, um, having the right equipment, they found use with WhatsApp. All right, so they say, it's so it's like a lost connection, but thank God we have this WhatsApp all right, so we still contact each other. But she did say that over time, it became a bit quiet because you run out of things to talk about. Um, but that's when uh, Sister Y has a very interesting story about how she uh, how she um, doesn't know how to do any video editing and all that. But in that short time, she learned how to do it. Uh, and she convinced her priest to get a laptop so she could learn and then she could start begin her training programs with the people again. Uh, very steep learning curve, but she did it. So different story, uh, but basically at the at the moment of lockdowns, WhatsApp proved to be very useful in ensuring that people stayed connected. Uh, right. So another 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 pastor that I interviewed uh, said that uh, a senior pastor in the church would just record a sermon on WhatsApp. Again, WhatsApp. All right. This is chat chat uh, application. That is the simplest. You take WhatsApp, you press record, you send a voice message to the group chat, right? So he basically put as many church members as, as he could into, into the WhatsApp group and then recorded messages and passed it on. Uh, then they just talked for three minutes, short, short sermons, okay? So the sermon is sent to them, some churches uh, to comfort their members, especially the elderly. They would send a voice prayer every day to the chat, to the group, and they were pretty creative about it. All right, so again, it's not about high tech stuff, although we have those, but simple things like Facebook, WhatsApp, enough to keep things going. Um, and having existing expertise, all right, uh, so apart from continuity of church and engagement in members, uh, some also used their existing skills uh, to help other churches. And here we got uh, two examples. So the first one is Pastor L. Uh, based in uh, Selangor, all right, in, in, I think, PJ, if I'm not mistaken, all right. Um, they actually had no problems transitioning online because they were already live streaming prior to COVID. So here's the little quote, my own church, there was no worry at all. It was a very seamless transition. I mean, up to that point, we've already been live streaming our church services for like a good seven years. So if we wanted to continue live streaming, it's just really easy. It's just a matter of how we want to do it. So because they saved so much time on the transition, um, so I was more dealing with other churches and getting, you know, helping them figure out how they can do their church. He started a chat group with other uh, church leaders, talking them through uh, how they could set up a church, uh, telling them what to buy online, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's providing knowledge sharing. Another pastor, Pastor H, um, who moved from KL, to East Malaysia, his hometown. And after spending some time there, 
uh, found himself in an unusual situation. He's an itinerant pastor. Uh, he comes from a multimedia and design background. Um, so he has existing literacy on, on all of these things. And so as an itinerant pastor, when lockdown came, they didn't move about so much. So he found a different way to uh, support the church community. So I actually helped my former church to set up all the media department. In a small town like Miri, I think they need a lot of technical support because online streaming is still very far. Most of the teachers here don't even do their video recording. So I volunteered myself. I'm going to park myself in different churches for two or three months to help out. At least either have the sermon recorded or go on live stream for the sermon. So for the first year, instead of being an itinerant preacher, I attended the church as more like a technical consultant or a technical helper uh, in a way. So existing expertise used to assist other churches. All right. Moving on. So those were the examples of church leaders with existing skills. They were able to do some of these things like reaching out to the community, helping other churches a bit more effectively. But what about those who didn't have such high literacy uh, when it comes to technology, which fair amount of them uh, did not, right? So conversely, uh, quite a few uh, leaders talked about how they could they experience a disconnect from the church community. So for example, Ms. Y, who is a council member in a church in East Malaysia. Uh, so she said, when the announcement was made, we were really thrown off guard. And I think a lot of us felt this way, right? Whether we, we were digitally literate or not, right? So when the announcement was made, we were really thrown off guard. We didn't know what to do. How do we move ahead? What shall we do? Uh, so we just decided to suspend taking the instructions, suspend everything, nothing. Nothing actually happened. We were not able to meet. We were not able to have any masses at all. Me and my priest, we started discussing how, you know, how to keep the people connected this time. How do we reach out? Because we have to keep the people going. All right. Uh, another example. So this one, uh, is Pastor C. Uh, he so happened was away when the lockdown happened. He couldn't come back here. So he was disconnected, physically, doubly physically. Not not just not not just being locked in his own home, but locked out of the country for a period of time. So this was his experience. Uh, my experience was a bit different, a bit more challenging because I was not in the country. I was in the UK when Malaysia announced its lockdown, right? So I already prepared to preach on a Sunday. And when the lockdown was announced, I have to lead church from there. So no one knew what to do. We had to make a decision to still carry on. And at that time, I had to quickly record a message through the phone in the UK itself. And I didn't know how to send large files because the files was too large. Our leader here just got the message, the raw message out to the church, not edited or anything. Yeah? And on a Sunday, the church just played the video. It was a very uh, limited effort, uh, the way he described it. Uh, it took him a couple of weeks to get back here and figure out a more uh, cohesive way of running things. All right? So they, they immediately become disconnected from engaging their members. Now related, apart from the technical aspects and the community aspects, all right? Uh, there was another concern, which is about the spirituality of doing church online, right? As a deacon uh, shared, uh, we did start investing in a lot of money into putting our masses online. So there's, there's investment and there's literacy. Broadcasting on masses online by YouTube and Facebook and all that. My own church spent a lot of money on that. And now when you go to a parish hall, you see cameras and cables all over, you know, and a lot of money was spent on that to put the masses online so that people could follow them on television. But still, that's just to keep them in touch with what's going on in the church. But it's not enough. It doesn't constitute an act of worship as far as we're concerned. Um, I do have a couple of slides nearer to the end of the presentation that expands on this about uh, spirituality in online churches. Uh, but here's at least just a preview for you uh, that the challenges are not limited to community and continuity, but also on uh, authentic 
on whether worship and spirituality is authentic online or not. So just, just to get us thinking about it. Um, and of course, uh, uh, and of course, related to challenges, uh, the steep learning curve is a problem that uh, many experienced and is not a problem to be underestimated here. Yeah? So uh, Pastor K from Saramban uh, said, I think it was a steep learning curve. Uh, I was really bad with technology. I think we will learn as we go along, you know. I think one of the things that benefited a lot was those teaching videos, which we suggested simple ways to make it effective. Because they had to learn not just uh, technical things, which can be time, which is time consuming. They also had to learn how to structure their messages differently, all right? Because different platforms lead to different modes of, and styles of communication. Second quote was a story I mentioned earlier by Sister Y in East Malaysia. Right, so I'll just, I mean, in her own words, uh, after a period of silence, after the WhatsApp died down, uh, we start to get familiar with it, technology, and to do recording. And I myself do the record, recording many times until midnight. Um, she had to figure things out. The plane comes, I have to stop. And the dogs are barking, I have to stop. Um, but then I learned, this is a new discovery for me. Of course, the students teach me. It's very humbling. The students actually teach me all this and they said, oh, do this, do this using online. They WhatsApp me and this is what, uh, and this step, this step, this step I saw. I record myself and I send them to it. That's it. Um, there, there's a huge amount of, I mean, it's not really captured in the way I read it, uh, but in the, in the expanded story, uh, there was a huge amount of uh, commitment to get the laptop, to record, to get the light, to learn, to get advice from uh, students in the training, all right, and and to force herself to become competent at it. It was an admirable story, all right, but it was a challenge. Okay, so it's not just a challenge in technology; it's a challenge in in pride as well, in humility. You're learning from your students, all right. Okay, so just in summary, okay, again, I'm being quite general about it, uh, but these are kind of the things we can take away when we are talking about technology. So digital literacy was a key factor in ensuring continuity of church and engagement in community, higher literacy rate, higher success of ensuring continuity and engagement. Uh, related to technical expertise, the ability to identify needs quickly aided transition. So churches that invested quickly uh, or identified what they needed to keep things going tend to be a little bit more successful, especially in the initial stage. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of adaptability that came up uh, in my interviews. Uh, being able to pivot to something else, learn something that they've never picked up before, even at an older age, especially for some of them, right? Uh, very, very important. Uh, and mutual support, being able to support one another, like the slide I mentioned about pastors and leaders and uh, supporting other churches, right? Uh, but all that aside, uh, we have to face the reality that uh, with changes like that, you know, uh, a lot of disruption, a lot of discouragement and being disconnected from one another uh, would strain uh, any church experience. Okay, so these are just some things to think about when we are discussing uh, the technological experience all right, uh, during the first lockdown. So the second area that uh, of focus uh, that I'll share about is on the subject of community. Uh, and for this one, um, I talked to them about learning about the pastoral experience and engaging with the church community uh, during the prolonged lockdowns. Okay, Because um, obviously can't go visiting, can't really do community work out there. Um, so what's their experience with uh, pastoring? Uh, online. So similar to how I presented it in the first section, right? So the, the first theme that emerged that uh, a lot of my participants talked about uh, can be categorized into what I call opportunities and new experiences, right? So the, the first related to opportunities and new experiences um, the first thing they had to do was to 
teach people how to stay connected. It's not just it's not just uh, the leaders, it's not just the priests, not just the deacons or the elders who have to stay connect, connected. Um, they have to teach the people to stay connected as well. So a bit of training required. Um, so like the first one, uh, Reverend L, okay, from a Lutheran church. First of all, uh, they have to educate the old people. They as in the leaders, yeah, bring everybody. If your church does not have a group chat, make sure you create one. And those of you who are in a group chat, uh, make sure that everybody is included and then identify uh, those who are seniors that are staying at home alone. Uh, those are the important ones. Uh, those who are your seniors who are failing health, things like that. Uh, get your group of people together, stay connected, check in with them uh, every day. So, he, so Reverend L identified uh, the need to train members and specifically the elderly folk because the digital literacy was the lowest with this demographic, right? They, they didn't necessarily know how to get on Zoom and Zoom or WhatsApp uh, and stuff, all right? Uh, Father M from leads a church in Malacca uh, said that thank God COVID came in this time because we have such advanced technology and telecommunications. If it came when there was no such thing as the internet and all of that, I don't know how we are going to connect with each other. So pastorally, we could still connect. We could still connect with our parishioners, our churchgoers, college members, you know, phones, using phones, iPads, whatever, you know, internet, social media. This is almost impossible uh, to not be able to contact one another because in so, uh, so many ways, emails, phones, WhatsApp, Zoom, you name it, Pastorally, I mean, in terms of connection, you could connect with one another, all right? So training uh, elderly folk, using all the tools available to them to connect and to take it positively. There's no way to not connect with people, all right? Uh, continuing on the subject of opportunities and new experiences, um, Deacon P uh, from a uh, from a Catholic church as well, all right, said that I have learned by online, we can do more things. So new opportunities, new experiences. Remember the team up there, yeah. We can reach out to more people. Uh, it goes across boundaries because last time when we have any formations or any seminars or any talks, it's always the same old people. The people who are not supposed to be there are there. People who have plenty of time to waste. They are there at the seminars, and the day we have a talk, the same people come. But praise God, this online platform, we were able to reach everybody. Busy moms, people who cannot come to church, with topics like suicide, talks about special needs children, talks about parenting. It's all 100. You know, we prepared for 100 and the whole participation, participation was full. Even non-Christians attend. So, as you can see in a little box I put at the side, he's identified that with online training through the church, uh, he had a new audience, new activities. He could talk about new things. Uh, he didn't have the same people attending over and over again, right? Uh, Miss Y, uh, as mentioned earlier, a council member in, in the church in East Malaysia. If you're talking about reaching out to the congregation using online platforms, remember earlier, uh, she shared about how it was difficult and they were, she was disconnected from the church for quite some time. Uh, they've adapted and they've learned as well. And so this is an example. If you're talking about reaching out to the congregation using online platforms, I'm okay. Because actually during the period, I'm, I've seen that people like to watch things, right? To me, attending mass is watching. So they like to watch things. So what we've done, so I'm beginning to show movies now. Uh, movies, of course, saints' lives and all that. So to me, that's a subtle way of catechizing. So people don't get bored and yet people learn and people are able to grow spiritually as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, making use of online platform to do things that should be done or can be done. Um, so another example here, showing movies online as a way of training people, right? So new opportunities. Uh, Apart from new opportunities, of course, there are concerns and challenges, the flip side of it. Um, and the first uh, sub-theme on concerns and challenges, and I think this one, every uh, participant, every interviewee, every church leader I interviewed had different things to say about it, uh, but they get more or less covered the same areas. 
Uh, so the first one has to be said that in the mind of the people, this is pre-recorded, right? It's not happening in real time. So secondly, you just sit in front of the computer, in front of the TV, and you are an audience. There's no difference as watching YouTube. All right. And also, you can be in your pajamas having your breakfast and looking at YouTube together. So the concern is members that members would develop bad habits by attending online services and doing online only church stuff. Uh, Pastor K agrees. He says, well, one thing I know is people are a bit casual. When they come for service, their attitude towards the service, because it's so near, you are just a button away. So people come in five minutes late, 10 minutes late. You know, people come lying down on the bed while attending the service. I mean, we literally see this on the video. We can see them lying down. So yeah, so major concern, church members developing bad habits. And, uh, another one, and I found this one really interesting because I did not anticipate it. Uh, young people uh, was a concern. Uh, and here you have some examples. It came up uh, several times that, uh, that the leaders had to learn new ways of engaging with young people. Um, I'll say more after I go through the quotes here. All right. Um, so the first one by Father D, uh, based in Sarawak. Uh, so we really, really need to understand how we can touch the youth. The youth are very, very difficult to touch because they are very tech savvy. They can just switch off or they can just pretend to be attending your classes and totally absent. So he's talking about training programs. Yeah. So don't be fooled. The youth look like the toughest, but one of the biggest drop we find is from the youth drop of membership. Um, I did talk to them about retention of church members, but I'm not going to cover it here for time. Um, but here, Father D is mentioning that one of the biggest drops uh, is from the youth. Uh, one, uh, one of the pastors of an Anglican church here, uh, Pastor A, uh, said that there was one pocket of the church that I think struggled more than other parts of the church, and there was the children and the youth segment. Even the youth, because yes, we can do online games and they are very digitally inclined, but it's nothing like playing sports, to, sports together. And the third quote, I feel what damage the MCO has done that is especially to the young is that it has in a way stunted the growth of human interaction for the young. How to socially interact with people. I think the emotional quotient for young people has dropped or being stunted, has been affected because of the MCO. And I'm talking about very young teenagers. So basically what I got from all these uh, comments about young people is that the youth had very high literacy when, when it comes to digital tools, high digital literacy, but that didn't necessarily translate to high engagement or high uh, perceive, what's perceived as high growth in spirituality. Um, in fact, as you can see in the uh, first, first comment by Father D, high digital literacy partly equates to the knowledge to switch off all right uh, they, they know how to switch off quickly uh, and it's also pointed that their emotional and physical needs uh, like coming together to play sports hang out all get affected all right uh, now I'm, I'm a lecturer I teach university students and I also experienced that learning is different when it comes to young with my younger students and my adult students uh, those who are working professionals. Yeah, there's a difference right, in, in the willingness to engage online. So it's true in churches as well. So something to take note of. So as a summary, uh, to recap the point I just made, right, we actually have to rethink about the relationship between age and adaptability. Uh, in the case of what happened during the MCO, uh, the young people, as I mentioned, high, high digital literacy did not necessarily equate to high adaptability in terms of church engagement. Uh, on the contrary, we found that uh, a lot of older folks, even though they struggled initially, low digi digital literacy does not mean low adaptability. They were willing to learn, they wanted to engage. Um, I can't say this for sure, but uh, my sense of it is that they were more eager to connect. Right, the, the, the older and elderly, they're more eager to stay connected. Uh, as to why, if I'm right about that, as to why, I'm not sure. Something to uncover in future research. All right. So the challenge of engaging the youth was a recurring theme. Uh, 
and of course the caution and the concern that in all these different adaptations and new opportunities uh, we have to uh, the, the leaders talk about the dangers of doing everything online couch christianity literally couch christianity right is that a kind of adaptation that we uh, want to encourage as a church all right so a couple of things to think about i'm going to move on to the third theme now so uh, the third area of focus of things that uh, we talked about uh, the 15 uh, church leaders all right uh, it's on the topic of spirituality uh, perhaps the most uh, variety in answers here or rather the spectrum is a little bit wider uh, so we talked about reflect so we, we were mainly reflecting on the spiritual aspects of online church questions about worship authenticity uh, communion with some of them I pushed it a little bit to talk about baptisms online uh, but I won't talk about that here. I think there's a whole presentation on its own. Uh, but yeah, so uh, for the first uh, first team that emerged, I asked all of them about authenticity, uh, and they all had quite a lot to say. Uh, you, you will find that uh, the spectrum of uh, people who feel that uh, online uh, online church has a lot of room for authentic spiritual experiences and those who said yeah a bit challenging uh, to have authentic spiritual experiences um, this is probably the subject area where Protestants and Catholics uh, have the, the leaders from both these groups where, where they diverge a little bit more all right um, they overlap a lot but they but the because that biggest difference would be in this topic of spirituality as compared to community and technology uh, but but the concerns are shared by both groups uh, right so as you can see in what i'm sharing so on the first topic on authenticity uh, can spiritual things happen through online services um, in the first area we looked at uh, we I, quite a lot of them brought up online evangelism and spiritual growth and they use this to point to the fact that spiritual growth can happen through online uh, activities so like pastor a talked about the first quote there so we saw uh, transfer growth and conversion growth transfer growth means a lot of people found their programs uh, useful and so a lot of people some people from other churches started visiting and conversion growth so conversion growth is the most exciting type of growth continuing the quote and we saw that through our baptism numbers lots of people signing up to get baptized this is later on yeah, for clarity uh, so we knew that they were people they were christians who had come through our outreach training program uh, they run a training program uh, for non-christians as well and so people would come and then they will learn about god about jesus and then through that um, as pastor a shares uh, quite a few would uh, convert to christianity during the online uh, sessions a similar well not similar but also a, a story about conversion shared by pastor k uh, longer story so there was a kid who came to who came to our church she doesn't come to our church and she doesn't attend any church so during the pandemic we shared the gospel online and then this person accepted christ and then she followed the online service very faithfully then she attended our zoom cell groups as well and she grew she grew because we could see her excitement in studying the word of God in her testimony, you know. And then when she came back physically, uh, when physical church reopened, uh, she got baptized one shot. She kept on growing and today she is actually serving uh, and attending more than one service. So she's very fervent now. So basically, if somebody could make uh, a transition spiritually, conversion, all right, it must mean that something happened through an online platform. So there must be something authentic there, right? An, an authentic spiritual experience. Uh, Deacon P from a Catholic church in uh, a town in Johor shared, yes, 100% yes, it can. Uh, it is done uh, in terms of spiritual growth here. Yeah? It is done to many people. I have saved a person. Okay, I have a friend who was committing adultery. He was telling me, confessing to me adultery is a good person he's my best friend catholic 
but I understood why he was committing adultery because of his marriage. So I was journeying with him. But the moment the lockdown came, the person who he was committing adultery with went back to Indonesia. But after that, when he started to watch the online talks, not just by Catholic speakers, but great Christians, he had become a new person. He is a changed person now. He's a different man now. He's a man of God. He talks about God. He talks about Jesus. The conversion, the repentance was tremendous. He is not the person I knew before. So it's because of the online that he, he sought his guidance and all of that. So he is one living evidence of an online personal testimony that changed him to be this and to become now a person who loves Jesus and whose life is just about God. And you know, yeah. He, was, he is one of my best friends. I counseled him and we were sharing. And I journeyed with him and I'm still journeying with him. I shared. So through online counseling and through watching online videos, uh, Deacon P talked about how a person uh, moved away from adultery to someone who uh, studies about God and became a very godly person. Right. So you have all these examples which serve as a kind of evidence that a spiritual transaction uh, has taken place. An authentic spiritual transaction has taken place. Uh, but the discussion is just not just limited to that, right? Um, not just authenticity. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned earlier the couple of things we talk about in online religion, authenticity being one. The second is materiality, right? Um, the physicality, the physical aspects of church, all right? The place of people, all right? Uh, and uh, related to that are some of the leaders' views on worship and church ministry. So our first one, Deacon S, uh, says that a mass that is witnessed or followed or watched online does not constitute an act of worship on the part of the person watching it or following it online. It does constitute worship on the part of the priest who is celebrating it, as well as those who are around with him at the altar. But it doesn't constitute worship on the part of the person who is watching it or following it online. Because in the Catholic faith, the material presence of the person is necessary in order to participate in the sacrifice of the Mass that's taking place. And therefore, if we are not materially present in that space where the Mass or the sacrifice is taking place, then we are not part of that act of worship that's going on. All right. Um, So that's the Catholic perspective from, from Deacon S. All right, I switch over to the Protestant view. Uh, this is by Pastor H. All right, uh, who shares a similar view. Okay, a related view. He says that online church service can only substitute. So that's one keyword there. Substitute to a certain level. I don't think it can totally replace. Okay, because I think typically it's very clear that there are a lot of physical things we need to do like lay hands on the sick. I think even during this time, to deprive from being able to give each other a hug can call, sometimes cause people to grow uh, very, you know, even handshake and stuff like that. I think it ties to a lot of mental health issues that we are facing today. Yeah, so I think we have to step out in that area. So being physical in the church, just in the presence of God, I don't know whether it's too abstract, but that presence is just different from watching a YouTube concept, all right? So it's basically something is lacking in the church community, all right? So the first one, it does not constitute an act of worship because you're not physically there, because being there is part of the, uh, part of the entire experience, uh, the entire act of worship, all right? Pastor H talks about how, it's, apart from worship and all that, it's also about the community coming together uh, there's something lacking with just doing it online. So the material aspect of church is quite important according to quite a few of my uh, research participants. So uh, so coming to the subject of communion, which when we talk about authenticity and materiality and spirituality, um, the conversation typically converges onto the subject of communion. Um, it's a nice example that um, it's good to discuss how these different aspects of spirituality and spiritual experience intersect here. Yeah? So if, I'm going to share two slides, uh, two different views on communion in the context of online uh, religion and online church. So this first slide here, uh, the folks who uh, 
uh, who have either adapted to it or, or see the value uh, in online communion. So the first one is uh, Pastor SC, right? Um, uh, works in a children's ministry in a church in PJ, right? Um, so she was reflecting on the subject of online communion and she said back then communion was so sacred that it must be taken in church but then we realized that you know during a lockdown you've got no choice you have to do communion at home right so there is nobody to prepare the items this is such a sacred act and yet it is to be done at home and for me personally i felt like there has got to got to that there was a complete shift of spirituality that god is taking away from the church and empowering homes because actually the home is where the center of everything, right? So I felt that now the parents are responsible for the children's spirituality. Parents have to take responsibility for their own children's spirituality. So she saw, she, so she saw that uh, shifting everything to home community, communion was a shift of responsibility that was still important, but to be led by the parents in the, in the home, all right? Um, the next quote is by Reverend L. Okay, uh, from the Lutheran Church, uh, he raises the question. The question is, does our theology, can our theology accommodate a virtual or remote communion? Uh, okay, that's the correct, not virtual, but remote communion, because they're doing it in their homes, right? Yes, all right, so it's not digital. So I advocated very strongly for it because the theology behind it, it doesn't actually bar us. Uh, the theology of communion allows for remote communion. All right, so um, I found this a very interesting perspective. Uh, he made the distinction between online communion. Um, I suppose that means doing everything online, maybe virtual avatars or something like that. But he said that basically at the end of the day, the communion was still done in person, just at a different location. It was done in their homes. So there's nothing stopping that from his point of view. All right, uh, Pastor J said that we still allow us, us to do it you know in our own homes it's more of a remembrance so focusing on the aspect of communion that focuses on remembrance yeah so it's like okay let's just remember the body and the blood of christ and the worship experience where two or three are gathered right so in that sense in that sense it's like how do we gather i know it's various places but we're still kind of connected so in that kind of theological implication as well so interestingly, he points out that even though they're all zooming in from different locations, they are connected, they are gathered as a body of Christ, taking the communion and remembering Christ's work, Christ Jesus' work on the cross. So that was his point of view, that the connection still exists, the gathering still existed. So to continue on, my next slide, uh, the flip side of it, the other end of uh, the spectrum of opinions, perspectives, right? Uh, you also, you, we have uh, both the Catholic and Protestant views who have concerns about this approach as well, uh, from, from the practice of it to the theology of it, right? So Pastor K said that uh, one issue he had when it came to online co doing communion online, uh, the other thing is we had communion as well, so we tell people to prepare, but we really don't know whether they take the communion behind the video. They don't switch on the cameras. So although previous slide, we talked about how people are connected uh, via Zoom and there's a kind of connection. Pastor K said that that's not necessarily connection. You don't know if they're there, all right? They're not necessarily connected and uh, you can't see them. So you don't know whether they're part of this ritual or not, okay? So second quote, uh, Father D says that the Pope and the churches allow it. Yeah, I mean, there's a dispensation at the time but allowing it doesn't mean to equate it to become a sacrament it's only saying that it's a devotion so when a person goes for online mass is actually participating in a devotion devotion to prayer and devotion to the sacrament is not receiving the sacrament itself so it's making very clear it's two different things all right uh, and and it's a special uh, extraordinary circumstances they are doing this. Uh, Father M, okay, uh, from Malacca, there's a church there. For a mass to be valid, 
you go through the whole liturgy of the word and then the liturgy of the Eucharist. And then at communion, you receive the Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist. And then there's even the element of community, you know, interacting with other people and the other members of the congregation. So that's that's how you, that's a valid mass, you know, done by a priest. Online, you don't get to receive the Holy Communion. So in place of that, we call it spiritual communion. So there's a spiritual communion prayer which the people at home say because they can't physically receive communion. So I will not say that it is not valid. But neither would I say that that's the real Mass because it's not meant to be online. All right. So, so the mater- going back to authenticity and materiality, uh, those are key factors that make the Eucharist or the Holy Communion uh, what it is, okay, according to uh, the views on this slide. So I, I'm, to make it very clear, uh, my, my presentation, I'm not trying to take a position on who's right or who's wrong. I mean, I'm deferring to uh, my participants who are the experts on this subject. But I just wanted to highlight that there's a range of views, different, and I know this has been talked about even prior to COVID, but it came to, it's obviously at the forefront of discussion during COVID, and I think it's worth having continued uh, learning and discussion on these topics. So to, to summarize these points, uh, as shared by a number of my participants, transformed lives point to spiritual activity taking place within the context of online church. Someone's life was changed because they went online to do all these things. Something must have happened. Something spiritual must have happened. All right. But I put a but there, whether this should be considered a norm is something to be further discussed and explored. All right. I uh, think we should talk more about this in, in the future. All right. Uh, and the Protestant slash Catholic views on sacraments clearly different. Um, with quite a lot of overlap, as I just showed in the last two slides on the subject of uh, the Eucharist. All right. So, as, uh, as I said earlier, a lot of engagement needed on these topics. Uh, better to engage than to not. That takes us to... Okay, so uh, we're coming to the last slide, uh, last section, which is the future. Um, after everything that things, everything we've talked about earlier, about the three areas, technology, community, and spirituality, you know, we start to ask the question about, okay, we've experienced all of that. Okay, going forward, how do we see the future of online church? So I'll leave two slides on this, uh, just two, two major views, all right? So the first, the, there are those who say that we can kind of split to two groups, one, no turning back, is what I'll share in a bit here. The second group talks about how, okay, no, we, we go back to life before COVID, but there are some things that we definitely must keep, all right? Uh, so here, firmly no turning back, all right? So the first one, Pastor S.C., uh, Children's Church uh, Pastor, uh, the bigger picture is uh, when COVID came, ministering to children uh, is a different ball game altogether. Okay, I think anyone in not just in a pastoral work or church work, or but anyone in some kind of educational context would know that teaching children, engaging with them, different from teenagers, different from adults. Okay, so kids different ball game. Um, they had to come up with a different way to engage the kids, but she also talked about how. Uh, the, the Sunday school teachers uh, became a lot more coherent in terms of their content. They worked very well together, new types of teamwork, new management of uh, the teams and so on and so forth. And she found that it was a really, really forced but positive change for how the ministry was run. So when talking about the future, she said that my team is begging me not to go back to that life before COVID. All right. Obviously, it's easier to be honest. It's easier because I'll just say, okay, guys, we're going to go back to how it was before and everyone just reinstate. You know what I mean? It was a very well oiled machine prior to the pandemic, but no, this is not the way forward. I think if we do that, we will dishonor all the lessons that we have learned in this pandemic. We will not, we will not dishonor God in all the things that we have built capacity in for the last two years. And we can't go back. We cannot go back to the way it was. So she felt strongly that God, Put them through all these changes for a reason to force them to learn something new and to make the ministry work better even though it was in trying circumstances that to, to 
to discard all of that would be dishonoring to the teachings of God, to what God was trying to teach them. All right? Interesting uh, perspective. Uh, the other one is a slightly bigger context. It's about community engagement. Uh, Reverend L. Uh, said that during the pandemic, they learned that evangelism and social work worked in tandem, right? Reaching out to the people in times of need is goes hand in hand with evangelism. They're not separate uh, ministry, okay? So uh, in that context, he said that I'm going to sit down with them, the other leaders, and really talk about how do we do ministry post-COVID. That's an interesting question, huh? All the gains that we have gotten from COVID, don't lose it, build on top of it. We cannot go back to do ministry as we did before. Uh, that is either delusional or downright stupid. Okay. So what have we learned and what are the avenues of ministry? What are the new connections, the new relationship that we built during COVID? Work on that, nurture that. And right now, uh, the ministry will take uh, different shapes. So again, it's like everything that we've learned, we can't just throw it away. It's quite silly, according to, to him. Right. Uh, then the the other oft mentioned future use of online tools in church uh, is for training and communication. Almost universal agreement here. All right. Uh, so Deacon S says that in terms of teaching, I think that we are in a very good place now in terms of the delivery of teaching online because it gives people a lot of freedom and flexibility. Although it still does require a certain amount of commitment of them but it gives them flexibility to access the teaching anytime that is convenient to them. They can arrange their own time. So online classes, online training on spirituality, on doctrine, theology, and church tradition, etc., etc. Very convenient, useful online. Uh, Miss Y says that, you know, you still continue to use the platform as a means of communication, sending out notices, keeping the parishioners updated, uh, and all that. I think this is crucial. So because before MCO, everything was hard copy, all right? Now we don't do that anymore. We have our e-bulletin that we post on our Facebook page. We make announcements on the Facebook page. So yeah, it was it will stay, all right? Uh, Pastor J says that online leadership meetings, and uh, quite a lot of uh, church leaders say this, all right? Uh, across all denominations, uh, management of the church can stay online. Online meetings, uh, just log on to Zoom, saves a lot of time, traffic is saved, so on and so forth. All right. So the, the practical aspects, uh, training, communication, engaging with communities, uh, st keeping them connected. These are things that are likely to stay in the future uh, going forward. Uh, the uses of internet technology in churches uh, divided on the spirituality, ex spiritual aspects. So like the earlier slide, you have some leaders who talk about having to build on what they've already done. Some continue with hybrid churches. Some have shut down their online streaming facilities and have everything back on site. All right. Um, a variety of different approaches going forward, but some areas of agreement, uh, mostly in day-to-day -day communications. Uh, but beyond that, all right, uh, beyond that, I hope that all the points that I've raised earlier are things that we think about going into the future. And with that, I come to my concluding thoughts, right? The three areas, okay, how do we think about technology going forward? I don't wish for a new pandemic, all right? Uh, but what about the, but there might be circumstances in the future where uh, church community, religious communities are forced to undergo very sudden and rapid uh, and steep changes from a technological standpoint. Um, I think a lot of lessons can be learned, all right? Uh, what kind of preparedness are we talking about? Same with community. Um, I, one of the things that, despite differing views on community engagement, different experiences, uh, one of the things that we uh, that I definitely found uh, that we can reflect on is uh, how uh, do we have a good understanding of our audiences, the people we're communicating with. So, like for example, have we always underestimated the elderly when it comes to, to digital literacy? I mean, when, when we read the news, when we talk about things like misinformation, disinformation, all of, all of that, newspaper headlines tend to focus on the elderly as more likely to be victims and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not really talking about that subject, but I'm saying that the media representation of elderly and digital literacy sometimes is 
not a full picture as we saw in my participants. They are adaptable, they are robust, they're willing to learn. Uh, so we have to think about our audiences differently. All right. And of course, in the area of spirituality, uh, I think this is one that will continue to have ongoing uh, discussions, ongoing engagement. There will be ongoing differences, uh, without doubt. All right. Uh, but, but what I can say is despite the differences, when it comes to a time where everyone is forced online uh, to different degrees, uh, everyone was trying to ensure that even in the worst of circumstances, uh, people could still grow spiritually. Whether that was successful or not depended on who you talk to and the different contexts that they're experiencing the COVID lockdowns. Uh, but you can see the different approaches to it. To end on a reflective note, I'm just going to end with two quotes uh, just to end, right, as a reflection. Um, to recognize that what, whatever academic research stuff we talked about, uh, we can all have different views about it, but the reality of uh, the pastoral experience, okay, whether you're a priest at a Catholic church or an elder in a Baptist church or uh, children's church pastor, you know, the, the idea of the of being the spiritual caregiver, right, so to speak, um, cannot be ignored, right, cannot be ignored, the, the personal experience. So, like, Pastor Jay here says, uh, I'll give a bit more context after I read the quote, uh, he reflected on life after COVID, right, with his church. He says, I'm praying and ask God, God, you brought me, brought me here because he, his work was primarily with the campus ministry with young people, university, college students. But I'm struggling to connect back. I got no inroads with the campus. For us, it's almost like church planting again, finding those people, sitting with them, having coffee and all that. I'm older now. I don't have the energy to sit in a cafe so long. I question myself, has my fire gone down a bit? Not the same as it was 10 years ago. I feel guilty telling you that. I pray the same. I pray to God the same. I know how it works, but somehow, somehow I feel a bit, I don't know where's the door now. Um, I'm, I'm just sharing this to point out that here's a pastor, after sharing all the different experiences he had, just said that at the end of the day, uh, there's something else that's changed. I have changed. Uh, in the three years, I've become older. I've come back to a church. Okay, this according to him, he's come back to a church where uh, even the members are not so young anymore. Some of them have gotten married, have children, they've aged. He's no longer a pastor of a campus church. He's now a pastor of a young adults church. So his ministry has changed uh, without even him realizing it. And he's, he knows it's a struggle uh, and he's working it out. So we want to recognize that it was not an easy time uh, for a lot of our leaders in, uh, in, in the Christian community in Malaysia. All right. Um, he, he was open enough to share this with me, um, and I, I hope we can share in this burden a little bit. All right. And I'll end on an, another reflective note, just to let us leave on a hopeful note. All right. Uh, Father M, share, I'll read the whole thing here because it's a, a neat way to end the presentation. Uh, reflecting on COVID nineteen lockdowns, mixed feelings. Mixed feelings because. I was sad because it was only two of us running the online service. No one else is around and supposed to be uh, joyous, disappointed. I was disappointed. I was worried. Uh, I was worried because how long is this going to go on? You know, when you cannot meet up in church and all that. Listen, I was hopeful. Hopeful because it was Easter. I knew that somehow or other, you know, God would make a way. I was at peace because I was also very grateful because lessons like this, you know, you can always learn great lessons from occasions that, uh, you know, to be thankful, to be grateful for what you have. Suddenly I realized that we really take masks for granted. We really take people gathering for granted because before this, everybody is so free to come out and meet up, to come to church and pray and worship and to meet up, to have a big crowd gathering. So we are used to this kind of reality uh, in life that it's so unheard of and unthought of that you can't meet together, you know, together and worship in church. 
So that experience made me to be really grateful and to be thankful for everything, for, for little things, even as little as small things like people coming together, to pray together, to fellowship together. So in that sense, it was a good experience, a good feeling, because it made me appreciate small things, you know, the things that we take for granted every day. So with that, I, I, I end this presentation. I hope that uh, I've shared something that's of use to, uh, to everyone, at least parts of it. Um, if anything, my aim was to present to you some common core themes that emerged from my interviews, the things that uh, they, they felt strongly about, the different areas of focus when it came to online church, uh, some questions that we can ask going forward. Uh, and I hope that this would maybe help us to uh, think about the future of online church in a, an organized and uh, purposeful way. Um, I hope you've all learned something. I learned a lot from my participants. I really thank them all for sharing uh, for sharing uh, their stories with me. Um, there's actually a lot more. I, I can only cover so much in this one and a half hours. Uh, so I look forward to sharing even more of my findings in maybe other presentations or in my writings in the future. So thank you for your time. Uh, God bless.